Hello everybody, I'm Jared Ross, the Genie Vlogger, and welcome back to another Professional Genealogist Reacts. On today's video, I will be reacting to the at-home DNA test craze is putting us all at risk by Verge Science. This is my first reaction video in a little over a month. I had to take a little bit of a break because I adopted two puppies and they have been taking up a lot of my time. But I've been wanting to react to this video because one of the recent videos I reacted to was by Vox and that was a video talking about an at-home DNA test can only tell you so much. Um, that video was pretty decent. It went into a lot of the a lot of good information. Um, I'm curious how this video will be. It seems like it's leaning much more on the fear mongering side, uh, especially with a uh, title saying that it's going to put us all at risk. Um, so I'm I'm curious how it'll go. I hope I hope that they give a lot of good information and not just a lot of fearful type of stuff saying, well, what could happen in the future? Because you never know what can happen with any sort of technology in the future. But um, before we jump into the video, please be sure to give this a thumbs up. It really does help me out. You can also click subscribe and click that bell for notifications on new videos. I will also be putting up uh, my reaction videos early on my Patreon. So if you want to check out videos before they're fully published on YouTube, be sure to join my Patreon. That will help me out. And then I also have a whole bunch of merch at my Teespring store, which I'll be linking down below. But with that all said, let's go ahead and jump in the video. I've always wanted to take one of these at-home DNA tests because I want to learn more about my family's background and they're super cheap, so I figured, why not? And I have no interest in these tests. I think it's really creepy for some company to have my private DNA. Either way, at-home tests like 23andMe or Ancestry DNA have exploded in popularity. By one estimate, around 26 million people have taken one of these tests. So maybe I should be worried about my privacy because my DNA is getting uploaded to some database somewhere. But here's the scary thing. Even if I refuse to ever take one of these tests, my DNA could be at risk too. Risk of what? The reason why starts with a serial killer. Our colleague Rachel explained it to us. So the Golden State Killer is also known as the East Area Rapist. And in the 1970s and 80s, he raped and murdered people across California. He was wearing some uh, type of a mask or a hood. And for decades, investigators just had no idea who he was. There was some DNA left at crime scenes, but even after decades, investigators couldn't find a suspect. So they had nothing to compare the DNA to. But all that changed in 2018. So the big breakthrough came when investigators uploaded a genetic profile from the crime scene DNA to this big, huge genealogical database. They didn't find an exact match, but they did find matches to relatives. Investigators used a method called a long-range familial search to find similarities between the crime scene DNA and a few of that person's third cousins. I've never heard of that referred to as a long-range familial search. Um, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's a term that has no longer been in use, but that's the first time I've ever heard anyone use that term, so <laughs> interesting. From there, they can narrow their search way down and look for a suspect within a specific family tree. And they found one. The answer was and always was going to be in the DNA. Investigators solved the case because of the big DNA database they used, which didn't belong to law enforcement. It's freely available, and the data inside it came from services like 23andMe. An at-home DNA test like 23andMe generally works by looking at spots in your genome called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Each one is a specific location where there are known variations from person to person. Companies make their guesses about your ancestry by analyzing thousands or even millions of SNPs. Populations in Europe, say, are more likely to have one set of variations, whereas Asian populations might have a different set. For an end user like Danush, this is the product being sold, a map of his ancestral stomping grounds. I got 86.7% Western Asian. But underneath the UI is the raw data, the log of all those SNPs. That data ends up in a private database owned by whoever sold you the test kit. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Investigators working a case have a few options for doing a genetic search. 
First, they could search through a testing company's private database if they can gain access. Family Tree DNA was in the news recently for actively working with law enforcement. 23andMe says that it won't do that, but there's always the threat of a court order. So that route is tricky. Second, the FBI does operate a national DNA index with around 17 million identified people in it. And some states allow the index to be used for familial searches. But those 17 million people are all arrestees and offenders. So unless the suspect had relatives in the criminal system, it's not much help. And it's also a very different database because the private databases uses SNP testing, whereas the National DNA Index or the other indexes like CODIS, LOTUS, SID, all these different indexes, they're using STR markers, short tandem repeats. But investigators in the Golden State Killer case found a third option. More and more, customers of DNA services are voluntarily posting their genetic profiles on free-to-search websites like JetMatch, DNA Land, or Family Tree DNA. This is great for anyone doing genealogy or looking for long-lost relatives. With a few clicks on JetMatch, you can create an account, upload your DNA profile, and maybe find a bunch of third cousins you never knew about. But it was also great for investigators tracking the Golden State Killer. So law enforcement used it in a similar way. They took the crime scene DNA, created a fake profile, and uploaded it, and then looked for relatives. That was the breakthrough. They used DNA info that was freely available. No need for subpoenas or criminal databases. It's just sitting there. But this is where my privacy is at stake. Let's go back to that big web of third cousins. It was used to catch a serial killer. That's great. But instead of crime scene DNA, swap in my DNA. I leave my DNA all over the place. I shed hair, skin cells, saliva, but I've never gotten my DNA sequenced, so I shouldn't have anything to worry about. But through familial testing, if enough of my relatives took tests, I could be identified from a DNA sample just like the Golden State Killer was. Now, I'm not planning on committing any crimes, but there are still privacy concerns for me. First, false positives exist in DNA tests, so I could end up the subject of an investigation by mistake. Which can happen even outside of DNA. As soon as anything happens, people are going to be suspects in a crime. If there's a murder, if there's a rape, if there's anything that happens, you could be a suspect. It doesn't matter about the DNA if you have some sort of connection to someone who was part of a crime or there was a crime committed for someone in your family even, you could be considered a suspect and what they do is they then rule out the suspects and find the right suspect. So I don't know, let's, let's keep hearing what he's got to say. Or a sketchy insurance company could find a way to correlate some of my genetic data with other medical information and discriminate against me. They can't. There's a law called GINA. <laughs> we asked a genetic privacy expert, Natalie Ram, about these concerns, and she said that the unifying problem is control. Your genetic data is a link that you share with, with family members involuntarily. It's not something I've chosen, and it's something I cannot change. And to up the ante, as databases grow, more and more people will be findable by their hundreds and hundreds of distant relatives. And then you've got to ask, gosh, how many third cousins do I have? Do I even know who all those people are? A recent study assigned some pretty surprising hard numbers to this. It predicts that for any population that shares some common ancestry, having DNA from just 2% of the people could make anyone findable via a third cousin or closer. For example, all Americans with some European ancestry could be matched from just a 2% pool. So if free databases get diverse enough, everyone in America could be findable via their genes, which means DNA just won't be anonymous anymore. So I feel like a big thing he's not mentioning here is that it's not like they find your third cousins and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, oh, we're going to be able to get his DNA. They To do this, they have to get his DNA and then do the testing on it to find the third cousins and identify him. It's not like we upload, you know, it's not like we're going to upload a DNA profile from a crime scene and then all of a sudden we're going to have the full DNA profiles of the third cousins. Um, we're just going to see what people are matching that DNA profile at how much they're matching and then we can estimate 
how distant of relation. And from that, we can then build a family tree to try to identify who is that sample, that sample from the crime scene coming from. So I, I kind of get where they're coming from with this, but I feel like they're being somewhat misleading and it's leaning on that fear mongering side of like, oh no, the boogeyman is out to get you. I mean, there are things to worry about with this, but they're not they're not doing it in depth well enough. They're they're leaving out a lot of information and especially the fact of the law Gina, G I N A. I forgot exactly what it stands for, but it basically means that in uh the insurance companies can't use your genetic data against you. So if you take a 23 me test and you find out that you might be you might have markers that indicate you might be more susceptible to some sort of disease, your insurance company, if they found that out, they couldn't use that against you and then charge you more, which is one thing that a lot of people worry about. Now, will the laws change in the future? What will happen in the future? That's unforeseen. Um, but, for, you know, I, I feel like this is, I don't know. Let, we'll just keep watching. The bottom line here is that we are rapidly approaching a place where we have a de facto national DNA database. For now, lots of people are debating policies that would regulate familial search. One law proposed in Maryland would completely ban familial DNA searches of consumer databases. A more extreme policy could create an official nationwide DNA database. That sounds creepy, but it might be easier to regulate than the de facto system we're headed for. In the meantime, while we debate all these questions, piles and piles of at-home DNA test kits are sold. The database continues to grow, and the genetic dragnet grows too. Hey, so we made this video in collaboration with Vox.com, and Danush has made a companion video that you should check out. Yeah, so our video looks into... Which I already checked that out, so I'm just going to stop that here. So, yeah, you know, I mean, unfortunately, it's kind of what I was expecting it to be. It was a video where... They, they don't give you the full picture of everything, and by doing that, they really play up the fearful parts of this. And, you know, I mean, while he does make some good points, and they are things to consider while furthering into this, you know, into this field of, of investigative genetic genealogy, it, it really is leaning a lot more towards the fear-mongering stuff. Um for anyone who would watch this and want to learn more in-depth information about this, the number one thing I would suggest is going online and finding one of the talks by Blaine Bettinger about forensic genetic genealogy or what's known as investigative genetic genealogy. Um, here they call it long, long, whatever fam familial searches. I've never personally heard that term, but I'm sure, you know, maybe people have used that. But if you go and watch some of these webinars from uh, Blaine Bettinger, especially the one from Roots Tech 2020 from earlier this year, he goes really well in depth and talks about the pros, the cons, and the facts about this. One thing that is mentioned in this video is that, you know, we don't, you know, even though there are private databases like 23andMe and Ancestry, which don't allow um, law enforcement to use that database, he they mention, well, what if they subpoena or ask for a warrant? And if you watch the talks by Blaine Bettinger, he goes into that information and they there are numbers about how many times that's been tried and how often that actually does happen, which I believe it hasn't really happened. So I don't know, you know, it, it, it kind of just turned out the way that I, I was hoping it wouldn't necessarily Um you know, if, if they did a more up to date one now, you know, a year and a half later, maybe they would have done it a little bit differently because there is more information. There have been a lot more cases that have been done. And, you know, when this happened, this was probably just like not even a year after the whole um, Golden State Killer thing had hit. It probably had been just months. So a lot of people really didn't actually understand how genetic genealogy works, how you actually use DNA to figure out family trees, which basically what we're doing is it's the same as if you had an adoptee who wanted to figure out who their parents were. Well, we have this person. We don't know what their birth name is technically. Sometimes you might, but you use that DNA and then you, you can find cousins and then using those cousins, you find how they triangulate together and then you can figure out who matches. So like for myself, I have first cousins and second cousins and the only other person in the world that has the same first cousins and second cousins 
is my sister. Other than that, you know, I may have first cousin, you know, my first cousins may all, you know, share me as first cousins, but they may not share all of the same first cousins because my first cousins on my mom's side and my first cousins on my dad's side are different. So that's how we use it is, you know, if you found my cousins on my mom's side and the cousins on my dad's side and you were trying to figure out who that DNA profile was, well, it's going to point to two people. It's going to point to either me or my sister. And with DNA, you already know if is it if it's a male or a female because you'll have the X and Y um, or you'll at least they'll be able to tell that in these tests. So a whole lot I'm saying about this. I'm kind of rambling at this point, but um, yeah, I mean, overall... It, it has some decent facts, but yeah, just kind of fear mongering. But well, thank you so much for checking out this video. I do hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. It really does help me out. You can also click right about here if you'd like to subscribe. It's completely free to do so. And you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Genie Vlogger. I'm the Genie Vlogger. See you in my next video.